Hi, I'm Amanda Sullivan. I am a fifth year assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. I've been here for three years. Uh, prior to that, I was at Arizona State University for two. That's also where I did my degree in school psychology, um, and I'm a licensed psychologist. Uh, I knew I wanted to go into academia probably my second or third year in graduate school. I had entered my program intent on working in the field for a while, uh, taking a position in schools, doing some applied research, um, but through my assistantships, I had the opportunity to do a variety of different research projects uh, beyond just my thesis and dissertation, and I also had the opportunity to teach some master's level courses. And so in doing that, I kind of started to think about uh, how long I wanted to be away from academia and what kind of impact I wanted to have on the field and how I wanted to go about uh, impacting the lives of children. And so for me, the big decision came down to uh, how I wanted my impact on the field and, and on schools to be realized. And so there was this kind of tension between uh, doing applied work and being able to work directly with children and families and have that direct impact on what's going on um, with a given child or in a given classroom or in a given school setting uh, versus working in research and in training of future clinicians and having an impact that's more diffuse. So the primary impact would be via the, the users and the readers of my research and via the people I'm training who would then go into schools and work directly with students. Um, and so over the probably third or fourth year, it really became apparent that um, I wanted to be able to do research continually and as a primary activity. I really wanted to be able to uh, train uh, future school psychologists, particularly doctoral level psychologists who'd be engaging in research as well. Uh, and so I made the decision to go straight from graduate school into a faculty position. Um, and I've been really happy with this decision. So my typical day right now, um, I would say I don't necessarily have a typical day, which is one of the things I really like. Uh, sometimes when I think about working uh, in an office setting or in a setting where I have like a standard nine to five, I just, I can't even imagine it. Um, because right now it's kind of a, a lot of the time I get to do what I want to do um, because I decide what I research, I decide uh, what I teach, how I teach it, who I advise, how I advise, uh, which is really nice. And so I am fortunate to be working from home a lot right now, uh, in my home office, uh, because uh, just given where I am in my research projects, um, I spend about 60% of my time um, writing uh, and designing studies Right now I have most of, I have several projects that are just in the um, writing phase because the studies themselves are done. And so uh, given technology, I can communicate with collaborators and my research assistants from home, and that means they can work from home too, which I think is great. Uh, and I only teach right now one to two classes a year. And so I have a research seminar that I do with my, primarily my advisees, and then I teach a course on ethics and law, which I love. Um, and so on days when I teach, I go to campus and I'll have typically meetings with my advisees um, most of the time that I'm not teaching. I've also got some committee work that I do for the university and so those meetings happen uh, conveniently on the days that my classes are also scheduled. Um, again, one of the, the perks, I suppose this, it's, uh, that might be some leeway that's unique to my particular department, but I have been fortunate enough to be able to um, align my research or align my teaching and meeting days. And so uh, I can allocate those, my free days just for my research time. Um, so a typical campus day might be two to three hours of teaching in the morning, followed by uh, two to four hours of uh, committee meetings or meetings with students. And then a day when I work from home, I might get up and do some work in the morning, go to the gym for, the, for a while, come back, uh, work a little bit more. It's very self-directed, which I love because I get to choose, like I said, what I work on, how I work on it, uh, and that works really well for me. Um, right now I'm in my fifth year, as I said, and so I'm actually going up for tenure now. Uh, and I haven't really found the tenure process to be daunting um, because one thing that I did from the very start and even before I came into academia was I talked to people about what the expectations would be. Would be. I talked to them about how they structured their time. And uh, that was something that was really useful to me because I think a lot of students uh, who are considering faculty careers are afraid of what it might mean for them. Um, because I think there's this, this myth, myth of the miserable uh, professor who works all the time. And, and that's not what I wanted to be uh, whatsoever. And so when I talked to some of the people who became my colleagues at ASU, 
uh, we did have like pretty com candid conversations about how much they worked and what their typical days look like or what their typical weeks look like um, and how they fit in family time and how they fit in personal time. And so I really appreciated having people talk to me very um, honestly about the fact that um, a typical work week for them was probably 30 to 40 hours. Uh, when grants were due or when there were other deadlines, it might be 50 to 60, but that was just a few times a year. And these were people that are one, so I felt like if that's what they're saying, and they have very respectable um, professional records, their CVs are impressive, uh, I felt like that's something I could do and still be happy and still have a personal life and still practice good self-care. Um, there's this idea of publish or perish, which I don't necessarily think is um, as daunting as it seems either. Uh, I think, again, it's about taking advantage of kind of that informal professional development or the professional development that goes on uh, through the professional organizations a lot of the time around early career development. Um, to learn about the editorial process that happens with the journals, to learn about, or really to craft that writing skill um, and those stat skills so that um, when those papers go out, it's hopefully a revise and resubmit, maybe, and accepted, but I think that's uh, pretty rare on a first go. Um, but I think focusing on developing those skills and thinking very carefully about uh, the type of work I want to do, um, paying attention a lot to the, the outlets I'm looking at, and looking at um, what they publish, how it's structured, how different researchers are presenting their arguments in their papers, uh, I think has been really helpful because then the publication process wasn't uh, as miserable because uh, there, I mean, rejection is just part of the game and it is what it is. But I think being informed and being a strong writer makes things a lot easier uh, because then it's just not constant rejection over and over again. Um, one thing I like to do when I was first starting out is I would send my papers to uh, the highest journal I could or a journal where I knew just in through talking to other scholars uh, there were um, hypercritical reviewers um, and I'd let them shred the paper and then uh, I would revise it and send it to the journal I really wanted it to go to and that worked out really well with a few papers for me and uh, those reviewers also gave the most comprehensive uh, reviews that I could possibly need. And so in the end I had just a really um, strong product and it made the uh, the second time around go really smoothly. Um, I also think that it's good to email editors and ask them about the fit because I think that gets around a lot of the, the rejection that early career scholars experience where they send their paper out to four or five journals um, and they get rejected without review because it's not a fit for that particular um, um, journal. And so I don't hesitate to email journal editors and ask if it's a good fit. And that saves like three to six months off the time it takes to get a paper published because it doesn't have to go out for review and be rejected or sit in their queue uh, to be rejected without review. And even that can take a few weeks. Um, and so, no, it, it didn't ever get to that place of kind of publish or perish. Um, I also made sure to talk to people at my institutions about what the expectations were, um, educating myself as well on the policy and um, what's written about what needs to be done, but at the same time understanding that kind of the tenure decision doesn't rest with one individual, and so I tried to be very conscious about talking to as many people as I could and kind of um, looking for themes across them because no one person is going to be able to speak to uh, exactly what will happen because there's, there's no way to predict how all the different actors uh, will behave in the process necessarily. Um, but certain people have different idiosyncrasies and certain departments have um, kind of develop a culture within them about how they view scholarship or how they view teaching. And so in talking to people who've been involved in the process uh, and looking also at the CVs of people who've been recently tenured in a given unit or a given uh, institution was really helpful because I felt like I had a good idea of what the expectations were. And so... I didn't have to worry about whether I was I was meeting the expectations uh, at any given time. Um, I was fortunate that my university had a really clear annual review process where there was lots of detailed feedback given, um, which was a wonderful thing. Uh, even if somebody's not at that place, I think having senior faculty look at the, your CV and talk to you about what um, how you're doing and what you could improve on and kind of what the pitfalls are to think about coming. Uh, moving forward. That's also something I did, even though the review process, the formal review process was in there. 
um, and making uh, use of multiple mentors at any time. So I didn't rely on any one person to be my everything. I kind of thought about um, what the strengths and weaknesses of different individuals were. And it taken together, that, that all made everything um, much more manageable. If I could go back um, and kind of think about what I would have changed, I think I would have taken more time in graduate school to get more research experience and to get more uh, methodology and stats classes in, because I think it's really nice to be able to be independent or as independent as possible in that realm as an early career scholar, so that you're not depending on people with uh, their degrees and stats or, or methods to um, assist you on projects because they're in such high demand. Uh, and can be very expensive or not available and can't necessarily give the support that's needed. Um, I think that can also help strengthen um, applications for uh, research funding and it can help um, so you're not necessarily relying on other people to build your studies because one of the things I kind of dealt with was uh, working with collaborators could take a lot more time than sometimes working by myself on a project, doing like a sole author or lead author project. And so if I was, when I was able to kind of take the reins on the design aspects of the projects and not have to be relying on someone else, uh, things moved along much more smoothly. And those are the papers that I could kind of uh, get out of there quickly while I waited for other things to move along. Because uh, especially I think working with post-tenure faculty, their pressures aren't the same. They're not on a five or six year timeline. Uh, to prove themselves. They've already done it. And so it's a different kind of reality for them. And so being mindful of that fact, I think is just, it's it's part of reality. Um, I also think if I could kind of go back, I think keeping in mind how much of this is, is self-directed and how much of this is about kind of envisioning who you are, who you want to be as a scholar and how you want to conduct yourself and what you want to be known for. Um, I think it's good to kind of have think about those things early on. Like, how do you want to structure your professional activities? And how do you want to structure your research? And what do you want to be doing two years down the line, five years down the line? I think long-term planning is key and thinking about how to uh, self-monitor and self-direct day-to-day activities. Because uh, one of the benefits of this career is that nobody tells you exactly what to do at any given time. Um, your projects are your own. Like I said, a lot of what you teach is your own um, in most places. And so being able to kind of plan all that out for yourself um, and kind of be the driver throughout the whole process is really important because I think a lot of people um, who don't necessarily have that vision or that awareness and don't necessarily have the time management skills or organizational skills, um, tenure track can be really uh, an unpleasant experience and I never wanted to be that way for me and so I took advantage of professional development around that and self-study around those issues and that made it enormously helpful but I do think there's other things I could have done to make it even smoother and so um, that would be my primary recommendation to others is, is really take advantage of any kind of professional development that goes on around uh, future faculty development or early career development really thinking about uh, structuring the process and organizing yourself uh, so that these are enjoyable times as opposed to like six years of torture, uh, which it shouldn't be, especially if it's something you're looking to do for the next uh, any number of years or decades. Um, because this is, I mean, this is wonderful. I mean, I, I can't imagine doing anything else. And I think any of us who are faculty in psychology or in school psychology especially, there's so many other things we could be doing. If we wanted to be working in schools or hospitals or clinics or private practice, we could be doing those things. Uh, we all make the choice to do this. Um, and I really do think it is what we make it. <music>